and thank you for joining us for the 15th of 19 candidate forums for the 2021 general elections in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber, and I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Shamari Scott, president-elect of the Chamber. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming Georgetown North candidates, Joseph Hugh and Johan Moxham, and thanking them for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Your willingness to appear on the same platform demonstrates to voters that you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online Chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions were submitted via the survey, and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important in the Cayman Islands and the Georgetown North constituency. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an organization that supports, promotes, and protects the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation, with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff but would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Fosters, Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate, and Dart. So a very big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time that we have live streamed the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to enjoy and watch them in the comfort of their home. It is now time to begin this evening's forum. I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and introduce tonight's Georgetown North candidates. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Good evening. Rules for tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions and you'll have two minutes to answer if you choose to do so. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption <coughs> and is free to differ with an opinion or position of another candidate during your allotted response time. Candidates should deal solely with the issues and at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two and a half minutes to deliver a closing statement. I'll introduce the Georgetown North candidates now. We'll begin with Mr. Joseph Hugh. As the former managing director and chief operations officer of his family's group of companies that include Hughes Hotel and Restaurant Supplies, Bon Vivant, McDonald's, The Office Bar, and Hughes Janitorial, Mr. Hugh brings a wealth of successful business experience to public life. Mr. Hugh is a past president of the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce and headed the Cayman Islands Restaurant Association for five years until its amalgamation into the Cayman Islands Tourism Association, where he continued to serve as a director. In addition, he has been deputy chairman of the Trade and Business Licensing Board, as well as the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands. In 2013, he sought office as a Georgetown candidate under the banner of the Progressives, and in winning his seat was named counselor to the Ministry of Constituency Administration, Tourism, and Transport. Following his re-election in 2017, he was named Minister for Commerce, Planning, and Infrastructure. He and his wife are the parents of two sons. Welcome, Mr. Hugh. Mr. Johan Moxham is a Caymanian dedicated to family, community, and good governance at all levels in the Cayman Islands. He is the proud father to two sons, Mr. Moxham studied at the University of Buckingham, UK, earning a law degree with honors and a Master of Law. He grew up playing football, and he represented the Cayman Islands on the national team at various levels. 
He also represented the Cayman Islands in squash and tennis. He is formerly head coach of the Cayman Islands men national flag football team. Mr. Moxon played a, a prominent role as one of the founding members and leaders of the Cruise Port Referendum CPR Cayman Group. Mr. Moxham has 18 plus years of experience in the international financial services industry. Currently, he is the managing partner of, of Lanston International Management Limited. Before this, Mr. Moxham served in various positions with Merrill Lynch Bank and Trust Company Cayman. His experience in the financial services industry led to his appointment as co chair of the Chamber of Commerce's Future of Cayman Economic Development Initiative for the Diversifying the Economy Driver Group. He also served as a director of the Cayman Island Stock Exchange, is a past president of the Chamber of Commerce, and a member of the Business Staffing Plan Board. He has also been a member of the Lions Club of Grand Cayman for more than 15 years. Welcome, gentlemen. And after this short commercial break, we'll begin the questioning for this evening. Please stay tuned. And its forum for Georgetown North. I'll now turn it over to the president of the chamber, Mr. Michael mm -hmm. Gibbs, who will begin the first round of questions. Thank you, Will, and good evening again, uh, candidates. Welcome this evening. Uh, first question I will address to Mr. Hugh, and then I will turn to Mr. Moxham to answer that same question, and we will follow that format going forward. Um, the first question then is why run? What qualifications, experience, or attributes? do you possess that make you the ideal choice to represent the people of Georgetown North? Thank you. First of all, let me thank you, the uh, President Mike and the Chamber, Will, um, Shamar, for hosting these um, uh, forums once again. Um, it's an important part of the election process. Um, I have been always a very civic-minded individual. Um, I have belong to the Georgetown North community in which I have coached football, I have lived, I have worked, my offices are there. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is my third election. So after serving eight years, uh, the first four years as a counselor for the Ministry of District Administration, Tourism and Transport, uh, gaining quite a bit of knowledge under the Honorable uh, Moses Kukernel, Deputy Premier. And then, of course, this uh, last four years um, as a Minister for Commerce Planning and Infrastructure, managing a budget of some $49.8 million over the last budget cycle. Um, I think my record stands for itself and qualifies, shows my qualifications to continue on as a representative for Georgetown North and as a member of the government. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, President Mike. Thanks to the Chamber for inviting me. Happy to be here. I think Will went through some of my bio, and that in itself you can see the differences between myself and my opponent. Um, my education, my qualifications, my professional experience uh, internationally and here in the Cayman Islands. I'm the former managing director of a Class A bank and trust company, Merrill Lynch Bank and Trust. Um, I'm grateful that you managed a budget of $49 million, but that would have represented one client in my uh, previous um, job. So I'm accustomed to big projects, big business, big budgets, um, but more importantly, the country is now at a crossroads where we need quality people who have the competencies, the substance, and the character to help push the country forward. Um, I've been a leader all my life. I 
I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to put myself forward and to represent the people of Georgetown North. Um, but at the end of the day, this is about where the country is and where the country wants to go. And if we were looking at this as a job interview and you were looking for an individual to represent you or have a seat on the board of directors of Cayman Inc., there's no shadow of, uh, or, or doubt in my mind that I am the better qualified um, candidate given my experience, my qualifications, uh, my professional standing and the things that I've done in life. Um, I've coached football as well, but I also stood up with my colleagues in Cayman to champion the cause for accountability, transparency, and good governance in a project called uh, Cruise Port Referendum uh, Cayman. It's one of the best things to ever happen. It was the impetus for a lot of what is happening today in the political cycle, whereby the leadership that was demonstrated there carries over into what I'm seeking to do now, which is to represent each and every um, member of Georgetown North, but more importantly, the people of the Cayman Islands. We deserve better leadership. Better leadership comes with quality um, candidates, and I'm clearly, in my mind, the candidate that's best suited for the role in Georgetown North as an MP. Thank you. Good night, gentlemen. I was going to say, I hope you left your boxing gloves at home, but I can see you brought them and you're ready. Um, the second one has to do with national issues, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Moxham. Mm -hmm. um, there are several national issues facing our three Cayman Islands. Please identify one or two issues that you wish to champion if elected. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scott. It's difficult to just identify two issues because I think we have so many things that are impacting us right now in 2021 that we're almost be, get, doing a disservice to all of the other things. But the one thread or the two threads that I think um, that run through the community are the soaring cost of living, um, cost of doing business, so on and so forth, and the woeful state of public education. Those two things immediately impact your ability to exist. Um, in Cayman now and to develop in the future uh, opportunities that will help you move from where you're at to where you want to go. So realistically, when you also consider the fact that we have a runaway sort of development regime going on without a comprehensive plan, that's a significant concern for many of us um, that are born here, that make this place our home and that intend to stay here for all of our lives. I think what's missing in that entire sort of equation is that we don't have a vision for the country as to where we want to go. There's a lot of ad hoc development where from Barkas to Red Bay, there would appear to be um, large scale projects that don't necessarily fit into the sort of, 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 of neighborhoods and more importantly, into what Cayman is right now. And that's because we don't have a shared vision for the future. Um, and we don't have a strategy uh, that speaks to sustainable uh, to a sustainable future um, where we're doing things to help one another. Education is the most important thing that we can give and improve on to help every single Caymanian. But Caymanians are struggling right now to survive because of the rising cost of living in Cayman. So they would definitely be the two things that I would 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 focus in on. But there's so much more, and everything is interconnected. Um, so it's it's not as simple as choosing one or two options. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh? Thank you for the question. Um, the, the the two issues I think I would I would that I would focus on the most would be one would be overall cost of living. And I think that breaks down into things such as housing insurance, uh, health insurance. Um, of course, those are things that, that are certainly um, within our control. Other items such as uh, groceries and, and things that are controlled by global markets, we have to find ways to deal with that. But overall, I think we do have to look at insurance um, and, and other household items or other monthly bills that are causing uh, persons to be able to struggle um, and, and, and live within the means of their salaries. We also have to review the uh, minimum wage, as I feel that that right now needs review. Uh, we have to decide again whether we're going to go with a minimum wage or whether we're going to go with a livable wage. My concerns with the minimum wage has always been that it would become the starting wage for all industries um, outside of the, the white collar professional um, industry. 
And then, of course, um, quality of life, traffic, green spaces, beach accesses. These are all things that I believe um, we will continue to, to pay attention to, continue to provide those for our Caymanian uh, residents and, and citizens alike. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, when we look at, at, at how we have developed and, and the, the, the way that we are growing as a, in, as a country, um, you know, it provides a very strong, stable economy. But we do have to make sure that we include the ability for our people to, to enjoy a certain standard of living within that strong, stable economy. And for me, that is providing accesses, providing green spaces, reducing the, the traffic congestion, um, making our roads safer. All of these provide for a better quality of life. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Staying with you, uh, Mr. Hugh, for the next question, mm -hmm. which focuses more on constituency priorities. And if elected, what projects or programs would you like to accomplish for the people of Georgetown North? Um, there are programs that we've, we've started. I'll start with, again, um, the road works that we've been doing, uh, creating safer roads, a shared road um, philosophy, um, so that persons can move around safely. Uh, Georgetown North constituency is a very diverse constituency, including Seven Mile Beach and then the central, central Georgetown. Um, other areas of, of work that we've been, that, that are continuing is, is dealing with the issues of flooding. Um, we've, we've established a, a very robust um, regime of the deep wells, increasing the depth of those deep wells, the size of the, the deep wells. Um, and as well as adding more, uh, we continue to work on the dike roads, on the dikes, cleaning those out, adding the necessary um, uh, channels for water to leave the residential areas through those dike roads. The culverts under the East Esther Tibbetts Highway, we continue to work in establishing those um, and maintaining those so that water can flow freely into the dikes on the opposite side like it used to. Um, this was a major issue that we've managed to almost completely reduce. But of course, as time goes on and another home is built, the, the water moves around and we continue to work on that. Um, and then again, of the, one of the other issues we face in, in, our, con, in our communities is that of the derelict vehicles, derelict homes, um, and just the overall quality of, of, of living. And we've been working very hard at that. Um, it sometimes feels like a losing battle, but we won't give up. Um, and, and just providing, again, a much better living environment for our citizens. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, some question, please. Well, thanks again, um, President Mike. But I think one of the key components uh, for the residents of Georgetown North, um, at both ends of the spectrum, um, we have to improve access to affordable housing. Right now, that's a, a massive problem for, for, for a lot of Caymanians. Um, we have to address the lack of employment opportunities for Caymanians as well, um, not just in the nice, you know, white collar sort of jobs, but we need to develop training programs whereby we can help Caymanians participate in this economic development boom that is going on right now. Currently, there's over $800 million worth of projects being um, developed and constructed. Yet when you look at the opportunities for Caymanians on those job sites, there's little to none. That's a failing of the government by not having appropriate vocational training and, um, you know, sort of opportunities where Caymanians can participate and earn a living there. Um, one, one other thing that I think is important, having walked the streets and been into the homes, and I'm so grateful for everybody in Georgetown North uh, that has invited me in um, and welcomed me into their homes, I plan to introduce something called the Community Assistance Program, call it CAPS. Right now, there are thousands of people that are dependent on the NAU, and they're just being run around in a circle. Now, in defense of the NAU, those persons, they're professionals, they care, but they are understaffed, overworked, and stressed out. But what is happening is the recipients of NAU support are not able to get what they need to survive, i.e. pay rent, pay water, pay the basic sort of bills that, that go on from there. My goal is to um, develop this program whereby the representative of Georgetown North is helping them take that sort of minutia and the sort of application and processing stage of it, whereby me and my team would um, effectively engage there. But uh, also a feasibility study on public transport. Right now, roads are congested. I understand Mr. Hughes spoke about uh, developing more roads, but 
really and truly, that's just building roads to nowhere. We need a plan um, instead of just the politics side of building roads. Um, that's, that's what I would think. Thank you. Question four, I'll start with you, Mr. Moxham. And this one, just switching gears a little bit, it has to do with the environment. Georgetown North includes some of the most developed and highly sensitive environmental areas with some of the last remaining mangroves along the West Bay Peninsula. What is your view about the ongoing and future development of this area? Massive project being done by the developer. I think it's important that we acknowledge that a pad does not mean that it's set in stone. It's merely the vision of the developer. But what has happened is we as Caymanians can't sell our land, sell our land and then expect to tell somebody how to use their land. Um, that's one thing. So I would, I would recommend to every Caymanian, don't sell your land. That's the surest way of controlling what happens in the environment around you. Um, if you inherit it, if you buy it, um, it is like gold dust and a rare commodity in Cayman. But I, I think what, what needs to happen is we need to have an honest, open discussion whereby there's an overarching um, plan, an environmental management plan, um, where the developer, other stakeholders, and the residents are in a room along with the government who grant permission um, to understand what exactly uh, the magnitude of the project will entail. Because quality of life issues are important, and it's not fair uh, for somebody to invest their money and buy a property to then um, be blown out of the water by something of the magnet or a project of that sort of size and magnitude. But tension and, and, and frustration set in when you don't have open and honest dialogue. And I think that would go a long way um, to help remediate and address some of the issues that exist right now. Um, I, would, I would push really and truly for a policy whereby we know the type of country we want to live in and we all have contributed to that, much like the Vision 2008, but an updated sort of version of that because right now, there is no sustainable development. There is no overarching framework that helps us understand what's going to be happening. And that is the root cause of a lot of the frustrations that exist uh, with current politicians, private citizens, developers, because really and truly the only persons that know what are going on um, either are the developer or the persons that they're seeking permission from, i.e. government, to pursue the projects. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh? Thank you for the question. Um, and Mr. Moxon is completely right about the pad development. Um, but I think he's speaking about the DART development, which is in West Bay South. In the Georgetown North area, again, um, you know, we have this, the, the previous administration, which was a part of passed the National Conservation Law. And uh, the National Conservation Law is ha when you put in an application to the, the Central Planning Authority, you have to then get uh, they, they would have to then submit that to National Conservation Council for comments and recommendations. Um, we also have, so that, that is a process which, which, we, which we follow. That is a process, even when we look at building roads, we're continuing to follow the National Conservation Council's recommendations. Um, we look at the airport connector road, which we're completing the first phase of that right now. The second phase, which takes it to Georgetown Yacht Club, connecting it to the airport, shows a huge mangrove buffer along the, the coastline there. So these are, you know, there, there are processes in place to ensure that, that the environment is protected, that we do as much as we can uh, to mitigate any issues that may, that, that may come up as, as far as the environment is concerned. Plan Cayman is, is the next step. Um, you know, the National Development Plan has not been reviewed since 1997. We spent the first couple of years developing the strategic document that will govern the, the overarching document um, for Plan Cayman which is where we will review the entire country over five planned areas over five years, as the law calls for, and the Seven Mile Beach Corridor will be the first planned area. And the draft uh, review is ready for public consultation, and, and the next government, should it be us or whomever, will have the opportunity to go straight into public consultation with it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, for the uh, fifth question, which will be the last one in the first round, uh, to you again, Mr. Hugh, focuses on housing. 
Housing and land prices continue to increase as developers build high-end apartments and developments that most lower to middle income Caymanians are unable to afford. What is your view on this situation and how do you pr propose to address it? Would you support building multi-story affordable housing structures as is done in other countries? That's a, a, a good question, and we, we certainly, I certainly recognize the issues, um, both not only from affordable uh, housing for Caymanians, but also from a government perspective, when your constituents have gone through the process of being um, uh, receiving a needs assessment units, um, help and the government's help, but then you can't find accommodations. Um, we continue to raise the, the, the maximum rents that we would, we would provide to, to our clients, but as we continue to do that, rents continue to go up. So we put together a working group of, of, with, uh, headed up by um, the Deputy Governor's Office. Uh, they had several roundtable discussions with, with the private sector and other agencies within the government, identifying first the needs of the government and then going to the private sector to see um, how we could best address those. There's some 100 and I think there was about 150 assortments of accommodations needed just by government that they that they needs assessment unit and the ministry saw as long term. Um, and so we looked at, at programs such as going out to Caymanian landowners, providing incentives for them, perhaps even provided pre-approved plans for them to build accommodations, as well as giving them a 10 year um, lease that they can go to the bank or get financing using a the concessions received from us be the 10-year um, uh, lease plan, 10 year, uh, lease, and as well as any other concessions we can give them. What we wanted to achieve is to not just to have someone build five apartments, for instance, and we take all five. We would like to have two out of those so that we also achieve social integration. Um, and whether it's 30 apartments, we would only like to take 10 out of those so that, again, we will have that social integration, allow the landowner to participate in a very lucrative real estate market as well. Other um, ideas that we had were some that they have in the UK where you have shared housing, where you purchase a house with the government. You come in, you, you buy in at 20 percent. Each year you can buy a few percentage more. You get to 30, 40, 50. You can then cash out, take your equity and buy another home if you like. So we have a, a number of programs that we would like to um that we would like to implement. Um, as that particular working group is now heading up the um, travel came in, and as soon as they're through with that, we'll go right back to the housing issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moxham, same question, please. Uh, no, this one is so topical, and I, I'm going to go in a polar opposite direction from, from my opponent here. The biggest reason why lower to middle income Caymanians cannot afford to buy any of these properties that are being developed is directly a result of the current administration's policies. This administration, and my opponent in particular, um, are focused on construction, and we can all see that Cayman's being developed for others. Um, Caymanians are not at the epicenter of the plan for um, why this is happening. It always comes back down to who are we developing for, and it is clear to me that under this administration, it is not for the average Caymanian. With the average um, home price of nearly a million dollars, uh, there are one bedroom studio apartments being sold now for $225,000. Uh, really and truly, it's, it, it's clear that that isn't to attract the Caymanian um, homeowner, young professional, um, you know, to, 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 to raise a family. And it's just really out of their price points. When you consider what's happening in the housing market, it's a direct reflection of priorities and policies that are geared towards everyone else except for us. The current administration is hyper-focused on construction. The current administration is hyper-focused on more people coming to the island. Those people are of means. Those persons can afford to buy up um, large uh, stakes of, of real estate in cash, further driving the cost of um, properties up. The Global Citizen Program is an example of that. It was supposed to represent um, a short-term sort of, of solution whilst Cayman was recovering and the world was recovering from COVID. But now those persons are transitioning into um, being able to get PR uh, by means of investments and so on and so forth. And what happens there is these persons have the cash and the ability and the financing to go and secure properties um, in the blink of an eye. And in some instances, I'm aware of 
some of these individuals buying four properties as investment properties. When you see policies like that that are supposed to um, be short term, driving the overall cost of housing in Cayman, where rentals have gone through the roof, roof and a Caymanian cannot secure the opportunity to buy a property, we are failing our people. I'd like to thank the gentleman for, for getting through the first round of five questions. We're going to take a short commercial break. When we, be, when we return, we'll have the next round of questions. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown North. I'll now turn it over to Shamari Scott for the next round of questions. This is question number six, and we start with you, Mr. Moxham. It has to do with beach access. What will you do to ensure that proposed developments throughout the Cayman Islands do not have a detrimental effect on public beach access? Uh, thanks for that question. Again, very topical, especially in Georgetown North. Um, there's no easy way to say this, but we need to make sure that the authorities understand the relevant laws and that one authority or agency isn't making up the rules as they go along. Um, we've seen instances where agencies are stating positions that are illegal or at best um, ultra virus. Where necessary, we need to update the laws to ensure that the spirit of the law and the intent um, for Caymanians to have access rights is preserved. Again, there's something called prescriptive rights, and those are rights that have been determined over a very, very long period. We have to respect those sort of rights, and we have to ensure that Caymanians are not felt or, or, or do not feel that they are secondary class citizens um, in their own countries when they're traversing the beach. Ultimately, there are a lot of historical paths that have been used, and now all of a sudden, 
you've got someone yelling at you, telling you to get off their property. That is a direct result of the fact that this administration failed to address one of the most vexing issues for the average Caymanian person. Um, the current administration was due to bring amendments to the beach access legislation towards the end of 2020. Uh, without explanation, they dropped that legislation altogether. Um, I have some idea as to why they did that, but I will say that it was just unacceptable for them to kick the can down the road again for another um, number of years. What really is vexing is they could abandon doing the right thing with the beach access legislation, but they could afford to give themselves raises and secure a severance package. That seemed to be a bigger priority than actually doing something for the Caymanian people. Um, we need to basically understand that representatives work for us and these complaints that we have where we're now having to pay lawyers to register beach accesses that have been around before your grandfather's grandfather's been born. Ladies and gentlemen, that's unacceptable. And it's one of those things that this current administration failed to address because their handlers and owners would not allow them to deal with the matter. I right. would stand up and fight for Caymanians because that's the right thing to do. And right is right. Wrong is wrong. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh. Thank you. Um, I am I'm unaware of any beach access legislation, but this administration did pass the prescriptive Absolutely. rights okay. law. Um, the prescriptive rights law is in place. We also created the um, Public Lands Commission uh, under under this this administration, which now is fully staffed and, and, and has an office. And persons now have the ability to address their concerns or or apply for prescriptive rights over these historical trails and, and paths. Um, again, I can't stress enough um, that Plan Cayman is coming up for the Seven Mile Beach Corridor, the review of the, of the National Development Plan, and this is where we will review things such as beach access, um, how we address them, uh, what can developers do or cannot do um, when developing uh, and, and dealing with beach access. These are all things that will be a part of that discussion surrounding Plan Cayman. So we will have an opportunity here in the coming months to, to participate in what will be a very public, open and public uh, conversation about the future of things such as prescriptive rights, uh, amongst many other things such as green spaces, um, connectivity, walkability. All of these things will be covered under the umbrella of Plan Cayman. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Man came out going to save us all, apparently. Um, Mr. Hughes, staying with you for the next question, uh, changing uh, direction a little bit here, talking on civil partnerships. And what are your views on the recently enacted Civil Partnerships Act? I supported it openly in the Legislative Assembly. Um, I voted for it. Unfortunately, um, it was not passed. I do not believe in any form of, of discrimination whatsoever. Um, and now it's at the Privy Council, the appeal has been heard and we're awaiting the, um, and that's not on, 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 that's on, on marriages, but the, the, certainly there was no question in my mind that we cannot and could not discriminate against anyone and that people had the right um, and should have the right to enter into civil union, whether it be same sex or whether it be opposite sex. Um, I, I supported it 100%. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Um, I, I, again, it's a really straightforward matter to me. I, I, I don't think any person should be subjected to any form of uh, discrimination based on their race, religion, political views, uh, age, or their sexual orientation. Um, for me, it's that simple. You know, you love who you love. And at the end of the day, um, everybody deserves to be happy. So I support um, people finding the right person in their life. Everybody deserves to be happy. No problem. Thank you. Okay, the next question um, touches on education, which we know has been topical for many different um, elections, and it's no different in this one. So, Mr. Moxham, I'll start this question with you. What is your vision for a successful <clears throat> education system in Cayman? What does it look like? What steps can we take to get there? And how will that success be measured? Okay. My vision for a successful education system is one where we emphasize inclusion, uh, quality, and high standards in teaching and learning. A uh, more successful education system in Cayman is where there is no segregation based on income or nationality. 
and one where the public school is regarded as equally good or better than the private school system. I would support a new um, governance model, one that takes away the politics of education and allows higher levels of community and parental engagement. Uh, we have to raise the standards. That's the, that's the first thing across the board. What we're doing now is not working. Um, and building $170 million buildings does not solve the solution that currently public education um, is woefully inadequate and producing substandard students by a vast majority. Uh, we have to raise the standards in teaching, learning and achievement and transition to a more inclusive and supportive model. We have to prepare a, each and every Caymanian, whether they're school leavers or persons um, that have left uh, school and are now in the workplace, uh, to meet the needs of the economy and to get them trained to deliver standards that our employers ex expect of them. Um, sadly, we've spent more time and energy on buildings and monuments than we've had on actually helping uh, people. Caymanians are currently at a competitive disadvantage um, when it comes to education, especially if you are at a public school. School fees go up every year and even middle class families um, are finding it hard to sacrifice in order to send their kids to private school. Um, and that is something that we can address. I believe that public education, or sorry, Cayman, uh, education for every Caymanian child can be and should be subsidized by the Cayman Islands government. And the reason why that's possible, ladies and gentlemen, is if we spent less time granting hundreds of millions of dollars in concessions to wealthy developers, we could afford to look after our people um, and have them participate. And when I say that, I mean from the KG level all the way to UCCI, um, ICCI, or the Truman Borden Law School. Uh, these sort of uh, subsidies and scholarships are possible if we made the people the priority. But right now, Politics is more important. I would like to acknowledge okay. the work being done by the Educational Council, being led by Mr. Dan Scott and Woody um, Foster. Thank They're... you. Sorry? Thank you. Oh, it was... Okay, Thank thanks, you. Will. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh. Thank you for the question, yeah. So we, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work with education. Um, we've addressed the teachers' salaries. There was an issue with with uh, with the migration of teachers um, based on salaries. We could not keep Caymanian teachers. Um, we were recruiting teachers overseas only to lose them to the private schools. We increased salaries. We are now attracting back our Caymanian teachers into the schools. We're now taking teachers from the private school um, into the public system. Um, we introduced a, a new challenging curriculum, um, one that, that, that was provided uh, through the UK. Um, and when the council visited there, we created the, the Education Council, again chaired by Mr. Dan Scott and Woody De Costa. This is a first step Woody towards Foster. Woody, Woody Foster. Foster. Yeah, Sorry, I'm everybody. Just trying to help you out, bro. Everybody, this is a first step in moving towards um, the sort of academies so, um, type of program where the council um, and and the board and the or the board and the principal have a bit more autonomy over the running of the school. Um, segregation is a physical problem. This is it's a physical plant issue. So if we don't build schools, we'll never get to the point where we can start to to reintegrate other nationalities into our school. The problem with that, and it's not the law doesn't say that expatriates can't go to the government schools. It says that the space available reserved for Caymanians first. And then if there's space available after, um, then we can include uh, expatriates. So until we build new schools, which are, 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 are very much needed, the, the, the conditions at the John Gray High School are deplorable at the moment. Um, so until we get those done, until we deal with the physical plant, whether it's through government schools or through private sector schools, where we can scholarship Caymanians into those schools at the moment, both sides, government and private, are facing a shortage. Vocational, I just opened the school, the Public Works School of Vocational Training. Um, we built a, a purpose-built building, building. 50 students will be able to, to, um, to achieve City and Gills qualifications, level one, two, and three in construction management, plumbing, electrical, engineering, architecture. Uh, we have the School of Hospitality Studies. We have the nursing school. In all of these, we give stipends. We uh, arrange transportation for them. For the nurses, we waive their licenses. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. You're welcome. Staying with you for the next uh, question, Mr. Hugh, uh, focuses more on the election itself and the, the potential uh, coalition government. Many candidates in this year's election have identified themselves as independent. 
that if elected, would you be prepared to join a coalition group or party? And which ministry or position in the new government would you want to fill based on your skills and qualifications? Well, the, the first part, and thank you for the question. The first part is I've already been a part of two coalition governments. Um, we are running uh, between the Progressives and the Alliance 12 candidates at the moment. Um, our hopes is that we can that we will win enough seats to form a government. And there are other independents that I'm sure that we would uh, work with and invite them to join the government at that time. However, I have been I've already been a part of two coalition governments. Um, and as they say, you can only work with the persons that are elected. It, it's after the election or after the election that day you can't go out and say, oh, I, you know, I wish you had gotten elected. Come and work with us. We can only work with those who have been elected. Um, but we do hope that we will f uh, have enough candidates to form a government and perhaps include a few other independents along the way. Um, as far as what uh, ministry I would 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 seek to to hold, should I be elected and should we form the government? Um, uh, you know, again, that depends on who's elected. Uh, but obviously, I would be happy to continue on as minister of CPI. Um, I do have experience in tourism. That was my, my background and, and my professional career in, in, in the hospitality industry. Um, but I'm certain that my colleague, Mr. Moses Kukarna, would be elected again as well. Uh, so there you go. But whatever task they give me, I'm happy to, to step up to do it. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Um, well, there's no doubt in my mind the next government will be a coalition government on April 15th, uh, 2021. Uh, recent polling data that I've seen um, indicates that the PPM and their proxies will not be able to um, secure enough to form a majority. So uh, at that stage, um, if I'm successful, much like what Mr. Hughes says, we're going to have to have that conversation and figure out what's best for the country. I'm currently working with a core group of independents um, that I think stand a very, very good chance of being successful uh, in, their, in, their, in their seat. Uh, but the one thing I can say with certainty is that the winds of change are blowing. Um, I recently saw the PPM poll, and um, I really like my chances, to be honest with you. Um, also, like Mr. Hugh, I'm willing to work with um, the other candidates that, that are successful after the um, uh, election. Ultimately, that's how the cookie crumbles you might have an idea in your head as to what you would like to do and who you'd like to work with, but but the reality is um, the people ultimately decide who uh, gets to wear the ring and be the winner. And so I would um, have to engage in those sort of deliberations uh, if I'm successful in winning my seat. I think, given my expertise, I think the, the, the question that you asked was about um, um, ministries. Yes? Yeah. Uh, given my skill sets, my expertise, my qualifications, um, I I'd, I'd consider myself competent and capable um, in handling um, the Ministry of Financial Services, Ministry of Commerce, and um, Economic Development. I think those things are very, very uh, important and, and tied in together. Uh, more importantly, I just basically want to represent the people to the best of my ability. Um, I will not let you down. I know the difference between right and wrong, and I'll always put Cayman and its best interest first. Thank you. This is the last question for this round, and Mr. Moxham, um, this question will start with you. It has to do with development and Kamana Bay um, in particular. In the past decade, Kamana Bay has forever changed the level of development in Cayman. What is your view about the continuing expansion of this development, including the recently submitted 135-acre planned area development? Do you support increasing the heights of buildings beyond 10 stories would you insist that the old Hyatt site is demolished on the site? Uh, thank you for the question. Let me start with the back um, half of your question there. I'm not an engineer, so I can't speak to the um, sort of substance or um, structure of the um, Hyatt uh, property there. I will say it is an eyesore. I'm not sure why the developers haven't moved to uh, address the issue. Perhaps they will try to retrofit that building and, and use the skeleton. But again, I'm not a, a, a structural engineer to be able to speak to that competently. Um, when it comes to building heights, I think it's inevitable um, that given the sort of shortage of land um, available along the West Bay Road Peninsula, building heights are 
um, increases are inevitable. I think I've been described by some as a anti-development because I took a strong position on the port. But the reality for the Cayman Islands is this. Financial services is the primary um, sort of, of, of source of, of, of income and the pillar of our community and now of our economy, sorry. And now development has leapfrogged um, tourism, which is stagnant right now because of obviously COVID, so on and so forth. With regards to the um, planned um, area development uh, um, submitted by, 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 by DART, I, 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 I look at that as merely their sort of vision of what they would like to do as opposed to it being fixed in stone. Uh, there, are, there is a process that um, individuals can go through to inquire, um, have meetings with the developer, um, raise their concerns or objections to the CPA. Um, so it's important, having said all of that, to have an overarching plan that basically involves all impacted stakeholders and strikes a balance between the objectives of the developer and the objectives of the surrounding community. Um, and I think that's missing because we can talk about Plan Cayman all we want, but unless you're getting the same stakeholders in a room to discuss how these things impact their life, Plan Cayman is just nice words on a piece of paper. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh? It's a very long question. Um, the uh, Kamana Bay has certainly made an impact in Cayman. There's no two ways about it. And, and, and when it was being developed during the 2008 recession, um, it, things would have become much more difficult for the Cayman Islands had that construction and that development of Kamana Bay not been in process at the time. Um, I think we have a, you know, there, there, we have to admit that and we have to recognize that it played a huge role in sustaining us over some very, very lean years well during, the, during the recession. Um, personally, I've not been able to review the, the PAD application myself, but as, as Mr. Moxham said, that is what it is. It's a PAD application. It's an opportunity for the country to see what their long-term plans are and to have comments on that. Um, the, I, the, the question on, on building heights, um, again, you know, when, even, when you're addressing things such as setbacks um, uh, from the beach, as we, as we recognize that, that global warming and, and rising sea levels are a thing, a real thing, um, we have to look at ways in which to incentivize or to get our developers to move their properties back. Perhaps even some of the established properties knocking down some seawalls and removing some swimming pools, etc. And one of those may have to be to give them a bit more um, uh, uh, a bit more square footage um, horizontally, um, I mean vertically, rather than horizontally and, and spreading out across and closer to the ocean. So these are all the things that we have to take into consideration. If we're going to continue to develop, we have to have development. We cannot stay stagnant. It has to be planned development, but we have to look at things as set, such as setbacks and building heights when we look at that and taking the environment into consideration, in fact. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Thank you. We just concluded the second round of questions. We're going to take a short commercial break. Please continue to join us. Third round of questions after this break.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown North. I'll now turn it over to the President of the Chamber for to begin the third round of questions. Thank you, Will. Uh, this question I'll address to Mr. Hugh first. Focuses on health insurance costs. Health insurance premiums continue to increase annually for many businesses and especially for persons who reach retirement age. What improvements, if any, would you propose to make health insurance more affordable for businesses and retirees? Thank you. We do have to look at, at health insurance, um, and there's, that is going to be uh, you know, one of the, the main topics of any government or, or, or um, objectives of any government after this election. Uh, we have to perhaps look at, at, at changing the, the type of um, health insurance we have, the programs we perhaps go to a, a social health insurance where we negotiate um, competitive rates with, with private sector and even government um, agencies for, for, for particular um, services, and then government would take care of, of the uh, preventative and, and health care services um, for its citizens, or perhaps just for the young and for, the, for, the, for our seniors, the indigent and, and, um, and seniors. Um, I know for certain that one of the major issues that we have that our people face, um, and this is not politics, this is, this is reality, um, in particular single mothers um, or households where there's only one person working, and that is that the law requires that their employers um, ensure their dependents as well. And when that happens, um, we see people coming home with paychecks that are way below um, their needs to cover their, their, their household um, expenses. I would, I would 100 support, 100 percent support, and have voiced my 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 feelings um, quite often um, to returning to the times when uh, uh, Caymanian children got received free health care. Um, I think that would make a tremendous impact and 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 provide tremendous relief to a lot of of families or individuals um, uh, in uh, dealing with the with the challenges of of health care and, and insurance. Um, the, the, you know, this, again, this is not, there's some things, and we talk about it in Parliament, some things that, that we just don't play politics with, and this is one of those things. We do have to find a solution, and it would behoove us all to come together to, to, to do just that. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Uh, thank you very much. I think there's a four-prong way of, of, of looking at this. We've got to be very realistic that right now, what we're doing and what we have just isn't working uh, when you look at the average paycheck, the cost of, of insurance um, is staggering. And I would um, suggest that we have a comprehensive review of uh, premium pricing led by the um, Insurance Commission, to be honest. Uh, you know, that, that's something that needs to happen. Now, we need to also understand and review uh, physicians' standard fees because when you look at what services are provided, and what bills get sent to the insurance. Sometimes you've got some unscrupulous sort of, um, of characters that take advantage of that, and that ultimately impacts pricing all the way around. Um, so we've really got to understand what the standard pricing should be for healthcare service providers and, and address that. Is it too much? Is it too little? And those bad apples that are taking advantage of the system need to be held accountable because it's impacting the price for everybody else. Um, we need to expand coverage for the vulnerable, um, in particular those with mental health issues. There are a lot of people in Cayman that are struggling right now. They've gone undiagnosed and they're almost left to their own sort of, of, of will. That's unacceptable. No Caymanian um, should go without appropriate coverage. Um, but more importantly, those that are struggling to, to survive because of uh, various sort of uh, mental um, health sort of issues. And I would um, say that we need to get back to basics where full um, coverage for children and students. If you are at the law school, UCCI, ICCI, uh, the Cayman Islands government, as long as you are in active um, education process, should be able to carry those costs and provide the services um, for free. Thank you. My turn, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Johan answered right on time. That threw me off. Right? No, no Will was about to say something, so I was like... 
All right, this one is for you, Johan. Um, youth matters because youth do matter. All right. What do you regard as the top two issues facing our youth today, and how do you intend to address these concerns? Oh, th thank you very much for that. I think it's a continuation from what I was saying earlier. The top two issues that I'm aware of based on research and canvassing and speaking um, to young persons, but also to professionals, inequality and mental health issues are the two pressing issues right now. Inequality because half of our youth are growing up without support. Um, they don't have access to quality education or any sort of enrichment opportunities. The other half um, have access to everything and anything. And so that includes, you know, things that we take for granted with our kids, music lessons, elite sports sort of instruction and tutoring to help them pass exams. But the impact that that has on half of the uh, youngsters is quite telling because they're made to feel lesser than and inferior to and we have to get to the stage whereby every Caymanian matters. Their circumstances might be different, but we can't have children walking around thinking that they're lesser than. That will cause a lot of other issues that if we don't address them. But um, the second item would be mental health, because um, I think as adults, we underestimate just the sort of pressure that, that, that youngsters and, and youth, um, young persons go through, you know, I've seen fights break out over somebody wasn't wearing the coolest shoes um, and, and those sort of things make no sense to me, but it's the reality for a lot of people. But what's worse is we are now quick to label children um, at every level. Oh, he's just lazy or he's just this or she's just that without going through a proper understanding of the environment that that child comes from. It's impossible for people to really um, make a judgment on any child unless you know where that child comes from. They're kids that go to school every morning with nothing to eat, with dirty uniforms. They don't have the structure and the sort of support unit that we have. Um, but yet we as a government um, have failed to provide the appropriate sort of resources, support to help them find their way and to understand why that child is behaving the way that they're behaving. And if there are any sort of mental health issues, which largely go undiagnosed in this in this country. Getting proper help you. at a young age is very, very important. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Uh, Mr. Hugh? Thank you. Um, regrettably, uh, one of the key issues that I find that the young people in, in, in my constituents facing is um, that of a police record. Um, it, it, it can take away further education overseas, it can, it, in many cases, is a barrier between them getting a job. Um, and in majority of these cases, it's misdemeanor offenses or um, consumption of marijuana. Um, I think we have to go back and look at, at our penal code. We have to, to, as a country, have a serious discussion about decriminalizing marijuana so that it is not legal, but a, a young person at 16 or 17 years old that that got influenced and decided to try it and got caught when they tried it, do not have a police record hanging over their head that stops them from going to university, that stops them from getting a job, even within government, um, it'll stop them from getting a job. So that is a major issue that we as a country have to have a serious discussion about. Um, we have to have a discussion about preventative measures to stop our kids from, from uh, trying drugs, but if they do, we have to find a better way to resolve it than to give them a criminal record and, and cut their future short. Um, the other issues that we face uh, surrounds education, employment, many of the things that we all talk about on a daily basis. But I think if we continue to focus on the, on the um, vocational side of things, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, construction, uh, hospitality, nursing, um, we could use a, a, a school for, for beauticians um, in the, I mean, it's a, it's a thriving industry here that, that uh, young Caymanian men and women could participate in very easily. Um, medical, um, you know, you don't have to be a doctor or not even a nurse um, or a surgeon to, to participate in the medical industry. There's technicians, there's a lot of back of house um, opportunities that don't require university degrees that could take three to six months of training. Things such as um, court stenographers. You know, we, we need to start encouraging persons to participate in a six-month course to become a court stenographer rather than having them flying in and staying in, uh, in hotels to, to cover court cases or to do the hands arts of the Legislative Assembly.
Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Next question, uh, staying with you, Mr. Hugh, focuses on the rock hole area. And what are your plans to improve the living conditions of the persons living in the rock hole community? The rock hole community is, is it's sort of divided into two parts. Um, and, and in each instance, they're very close communities. Um, at the moment, um, the, the long planned um, Godfrey Nixon extension is happening through the rock hole community. Um, the open uh, uh, property owned by the government that was supposed to be the Georgetown Primary School um, is now identified for the Sunrise Adult Training Center and, and, and the necessary um, services for them. So the whole area is going through a, a, um, a rejuvenation of sorts, or, 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 and, and the, the Godfrey Nixon extension will have the um, will be our first complete streets um, methodology um, street, if <laughs> um, built under that first road built under complete streets methodology. Um, which will provide a very nice thoroughway with uh, bike lanes and, and segregated sidewalks, et cetera. And it's really going to enhance the area um, within Rock Hole. We have been doing a lot of cleaning up in Rock Hole. We've been uh, dealing with derelict homes. Um, there was a developer that bought a, a, a tremendous amount of property to do a, a, a large development there. I think you may remember the, the, uh, the ice, ice palace um, which left a lot of dilapidated homes and, and unattended properties in its path. And so we've been working on cleaning those up. But again, it's one of those things that we clean up one area and, 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 uh, and we find that another area um, becomes in a dilapidated position. But overall, um, the connectivity into Georgetown um, and the Georgetown revitalization will take its time and move into that area. And when we move into the second phase of that, which, is, which we're describing as... as um, the urban redevelopment and the rock hole uh, central and surrounding areas would be the first areas um, addressed. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Uh, my opponent referred to it as um, regeneration. What's happening in rock hole is the regentrification, whereby policy decision has been made to move people out. They're putting a major highway through neighborhoods um, and roads and homes of people that have been living there for multiple generations without any plan as to where those individuals will be relocated. Um, there are offers that are being made to individuals now who, home, who own rental properties or rooms, and they're being offered three years rent, yet these people are 70 years old, they'll probably live another 15 years, and the price point of to purchase their land is, is, is really is uh, pennies on, on, on the dollar. That's not representation because you can't move people out when they're old and not have them go somewhere um, that they're comfortable with. And secondly, if you've now deprived them of their ability to earn from their rental properties, that will further put them back into the system where we are responsible for looking after them. Um, we have to have more respect for not just Rock Hole, but all of the surrounding communities whereby there is no inclusion or explanation as to what the plan is. There's a massive development that is being planned um, for that sort of area. I think uh, my opponent referred to it as phase one. My opponent owes it to the people of Rock Hole and the surrounding community to be honest with them um, and explain to them and give them all of the details as to why this is happening, what the major plans are, and who the developer is that has bought all the land and also the major complexes. When you look at what's happening, Georgetown is being killed off by the government. By the government. Your representative is doing that to you and not being honest enough with you. And that's not something that I think is acceptable. And it's not something that I would do in the name of our government policy. No Caymanian must be left behind and no Caymanian must be taken advantage of. And sadly, the current administration is doing that. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, this um, question will start with you, and it has to do with employment um, and work. With regards to the new Department of Work system that's been implemented in recent years, do you consider the system a success? If not, what improvements would you recommend? Uh, first, let me just start off by saying uh, the leadership team at work, you've got some really solid people there, good civil servants. Um, I don't think it's down to the personalities, I think that the system um, or program was rushed and therefore you're having some significant issues. 
I'll give you an example. If you apply to work for a candidate, you shouldn't have to apply three mm-hmm. times into a portal um, where the information goes into nowhere. Uh, we talk about e-government, but at a basic level, the portal at work um, eats up time, man hours, billable hours. More importantly, work then also provides you with candidates at time that are not qualified for the position that you're applying for. You can't send a painter to a corporate services um, office and think that anyone will have confidence in the system or want to help work when work isn't helping us. But the reason why these failings are happening, in my opinion, is absence of data. Um, We don't really rely on data enough to make big decisions in this country. Uh, What we do is we label new projects, new teams, and we just kind of go, this is the same pig with a new dress, to be honest with you. And we've got to get to the stage whereby we're able to use information to guide our decisions. Um, Some jobs you can train for in three months. Some jobs you might take three years. But at the end of the day, are we in a position whereby we have the data that is matching up the skill set of the individual with the request of the employer. I don't think that that is consistently happening, um, but it's no different from a lot of the other issues that we've had. But again, there comes a point where the game of politics is you have to be seen to be doing something. So we go from whatever it was called before to now work, but work isn't working for all of us. The solutions, though, are in the SEAC report that was put together, uh, but we've had no recommendations or follow up on those reports. Um, and the solutions are in are embodied in that, given the stakeholder group that worked on it. That's a failure of implementation, but the solutions are there because everybody knows um, what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Moxon. Mr. Hugh? Thank you very much. The, uh, there has been challenges with the work program um, or, or with the work uh, department and, and what it was set up for. As we were moving towards the CBC um, uh, and, amal- and, and amalgamating customs and immigration, we, we, we had recognized even previous to that, that it was difficult for uh, persons in immigration to, to have the knowledge needed to make a decision on a work permit. Um, the knowledge of, of employment and, and, and what is happening within um, that area to, to decide on a work permit. Immigration is charged with immigration, the coming and going of people into the country and the security of the country. So work was developed to be that agency that would then be able to provide the information to the work permit board or to the um, agents at immigration to provide or to issue a work permit or to refuse a work permit. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge there, other than that of the technology, um, is that we have to rely or they have to rely on the individual or the, the citizens to provide the information to them. There is no way we don't have with the absence of income tax. We don't know anything about our Caymanian people. We know everything about a work permit holder because they have to put it on their work permit, where they live, how much they make, who they're employed by everything. But with the absence of income tax, we don't know anything about our Caymanian people and we have to rely on them to provide the information. I do believe that they, that they, um, eminent um, launch of the the electronic ID programs. Um, Once we go digital, we'll go far away in assisting with that, but it certainly isn't going to be the solution either. We have to find a way to get information on our Caymanian people so that we can make um, informed decisions when we approve or disapprove work permits, um, as well as to screen the applicants through work as to see whether or not they need further training, um, whether or not they fit the roles that they're looking for, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. So the next question, which will be the last one in this current round, uh, starting with you, Mr. Hugh, focuses on economic diversification. The question is, financial services continues to come under external pressures and tourism may never return to the level uh, levels before the pandemic. So what are your views about diversifying the economy and which areas would you support and encourage? I'm, I'm a huge supporter in diversifying the economy. Um, and in fact, even diversifying the financial services industry. This is why we have just recently, um, uh, got, Cabinet has, has given permission for my ministry um, to, to continue uh, seeking the 
um, implementation of a new undersea on, on um, uh, fiber cable, providing state-of-the-art technology and um, uh, connectivity to the world. We feel that this is key if we're going to continue down the road of attracting, um, and, and this was one of the recommendations from the SEAC, in, in attracting the technology-based services that that um, that we've seen showing interest in the country. This is certainly one of the areas, and an area as well, that um, uh, young Caymanians have a, a keen interest in. Um, I believe that there's opportunities there when we look at the Sister Islands, Cayman Brac, the standard for data banking is 50 feet above sea level. We have the bluff there. Um, we're not on the side of a mountain or anything. It's a perfect place for that sort of industry. We just need to have the, the re reliable internet connection and the redundancy there. Um, other areas include, um, uh, in the same sense, um, we, we pass legislation, sandbox legislation for the fintech industry, but we need to take it a step further and pass in legislation for digital currencies. Um, this is, it's coming. There's no two ways about it. Digital currencies are coming. Our neighbors here in the Caribbean are already implementing digital currencies, but this is another huge industry for us. Um, and I know that that ministry is already looking at the necessary legislation to add to the, to the, to the, um, already to the current legislation. We have sandbox legislation for um, the, the tech, fintech industry. Um, the other areas, of course, is medical tourism, and we've made that very clear in, in our efforts to, to make Cayman the, the, the premier destination for medical tourism. Um, you know, it, it only bodes well. I always use the example of um, if you go out to eat dinner, you go to West Bay Road because that's all where the restaurants are. You can make a decision then. I think that's where we're going to be with medical tourism as well. Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Um, before we throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, let's not be negative about financial services. It is the lifeblood. It is a thing that makes Cayman what it is. Everybody in this room, as a Minister of Commerce, he would, would recognize that as well. Financial services industry represents over 60% of the GDP of the Cayman Islands. Since COVID, it's gone. Um, it's even more important. So whilst I appreciate the desire or the um, contemplation of diversification, every other country in the Caribbean would die to have what we have. So what we should be doing instead of thinking of other ways or just in case something bad happens, we should be doing everything in our powers to protect, grow, and sustain, uh, sorry, protect, sustain, and grow the financial services industry. I think my colleague mentioned um, the diversification of financial services. I'm not sure what he's talking about there, but you cannot move away from the thing that provides the Cayman Islands and all of the programs that we all benefit from, um, the first world status that we have. Uh, with that said, I support diversification, uh, the concept of diversification, if it's smart and, and the responsible thing to do. However, we have to again protect the most important thing, which is financial services and find the right programs and systems and um, um, work collectively to restore tourism with a new focus on quality and sustainability, not mass tourism. Having said that, attempts are being made to diversify into healthcare, um, FinTech, I think my colleague just mentioned there, but there's an opportunity that we're missing whereby we aren't leveraging Cayman's tax um, neutral status, whereby we should be the hub for all sort of tertiary um, level education, premium programs. The Cayman Islands is an incredible place to live, work and play. And we should be partnering with educational institutes in order to attract them to bring their programs here into Cayman. That would um, help us uh, drive the economy. Um, Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Three rounds of questions finished. One more round. We'll return for the final round of questions right after this short break.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forums for Georgetown North. I'm going to turn it over to Shamari Scott, who's going to begin the final round of questioning for this evening. Gentlemen, I have the pleasure of the first and last question for this round. So good luck. And this one has to do with cost of living. And I'll start with you, Mr. Moxham. The cost of living ranked as the top issue for respondents in the most recent chamber public survey. What additional strategies would you propose to address this issue beyond those you've already touched on? Well, I, I don't think I need to go into too much um, sort of explanation as to how it's impacting us, but um, we need to devise strategies that will help us lower <clears throat> um, our electricity bills. Um, we would achieve that by introducing solar energy to, to, to lower uh, electricity bills. We have to basically lower the cost of health care. We spoke about that earlier, but if I went straight to the to the bare bones of this, a review and adjustment of minimum wage. Right now, we hear and we see that Caymanians are not able to afford, um, you know, just surviving. What's incredible is the current administration seem unwilling to pay a livable wage and are happy for the rank and file Caymanians and the workforce to um, collect six dollars an hour. Yet government programs like NICE pay $10 an hour. And if you are a supervisor in the NICE program, you get paid $12 an hour. So organically, and, and if you have any sort of conscience, the government must recognize that people can't survive on $6 an hour, hence they're paying more. I think that is some sort of voodoo math that I'll never figure out with the government, but that's something that we definitely have to look, look at. Um, cost of living sort of, of strategies to, 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 to help our people, incentivizing the local market to increase the supply for affordable or um, rental properties and for houses for Caymanians. I think it's possible for the government to buy large tracts of land in every district and to devise a um, program where these properties, um, which will be master planned sort of development and mixed use developments, are available for um, sale to Caymanians alone, not as investment properties. Um, it's just, you know, something that, that, that should be and can be done. And the third thing would be introduce and investigate um, a quality, reliable public transport system. Uh, being stuck out in the eastern districts, um, it's, it's crazy. The minister is well aware of what's going on. We've gone from two lanes to three lanes that lead to the same one bottleneck, but that's called progress, and in my mind it isn't. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh? Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the question. Um, we spoke about insurance earlier. I think that's, that, that's a tremendous um, hurdle for, for many persons as I spoke, especially those who are, who are earning on the lower end of the salary scale and have a couple of children or a few dependents that they have to cover. Uh, minimum wage, again, we spoke about that earlier. We have to address that. I am not convinced myself that minimum wage is the answer, but a livable wage is something that we should consider. The minute you set a minimum wage, that simply just becomes the entry wage to any job um, outside of white-collar work. So I, I think it's something we have to look at, whether we, we do have a minimum wage and a recommended um, a livable wage. Um, I haven't seen a chamber salary survey in a while. Um, perhaps that could be useful and something we could we could see done again. Um, national energy policy, my, um, Mr. Markson spoke to that. That's very much in gear. Um, we just saw uh, another allotment of of um, of energy to the to the um, solar program. Um, we'll continue down that road. Uh, there is a, a RFP out, and I think it's been awarded for for battery storage, so that we can continue to increase um, our our reliability on renewable energies and reduce our, our dependability on fossil fuels. Um, we also want to, you know, one of my pet peeves is the government contracts. When we issue government contracts, we, we tend to beat the, 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 um, the ministries tend to go for the most affordable. Um, what I have done in my ministry, in particular with the security guards at the government administration building, is to require that they, um, we told them all that we're going to require that they all have at least 60% Caymanians um, employed at the government building. 
what is that going to cost you? They came back and said, this is what we're going to need to pay Caymanians to take this job. And so we increased the budget so that they could achieve that 60% Caymanians at the security um, offices in the government administration building. Uh, we need to look at custom tariffs, things such as baby food is considered processed, while fresh food, milk, um, meats, uh, all that sort of stuff, fruits and vegetables are duty-free, processed or dutable. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Uh, staying with you, Mr. Hugh, for the next question. Um, it's talking about hotel development and the potential moratorium. And the question is, in the 1980s, the government imposed a moratorium on new hotel development, which allowed the existing hotels to maintain a good level of occupancy and for the country to improve its infrastructure to keep pace with the growth. If elected, would you support imposing a moratorium on new hotel development along the Seven Mile Beach Peninsula? Thank you. I I, I don't see. I, I think that would not that would be premature at this time. Um, prior to COVID, our hotels were uh, were getting the the highest data room rate in the region by some ten percent, almost ten percent. Um, that in itself could lead to us not being competitive. We also don't want to be in a position where we were back in the eighties, where one entity owned all of our major hotels. And if they had 50% in each hotel, then they had 150% occupancy across the island. I think we're premature. We'll be premature in talking about putting a moratorium on hotels. I think we can start to discuss what types of hotels, um, what are we looking for. All of this was, was laid out in the recent National Tourism Plan, which has become a part of the, the review in the National um, Development Plan review. So, you know, that would be premature, but I do believe we want to look at how we can encourage persons to develop outside of the Seven Mile Beach Corridor and within the Seven Mile Beach Corridor, what types of development are we looking for? Thank you. Mr. Moxham, same question. Uh, thank you for the question. I just want to take 10 seconds to address um, the previous question. I just want the minister and the public to be aware that the national energy policy is not being implemented by OFREG. OFREG follow a policy that has been given to them by the licensee Caribbean Utilities com um, uh, companies. Unless we can get our regulatory agencies to follow the national energy policy, there is no chance that we will ever see a decrease in the sort of cost of electricity. That needs to be noted. Um, uh, to address the main point here, we, it's a conversation and things we have to look to, to, to look at with regards to moratorium. Um, on hotels. However, at this stage, I, I would agree um, it's it's somewhat premature to do so. And in fact, I'd go a step further um, and say I wouldn't um, support a moratorium. And here's why. Hotels are effectively um, an economic engine generating employment for many Caymanians, revenue for local companies and substantial revenue for the government. The tourism industry has been hardest hit by the pandemic, both here and around the world. We have more than a thousand Caymanians that are suffering and because of COVID-19 um, and what it's done to the tourism industry. We read recently where by um, cruise tourism will likely not come back anytime soon. There are many Caymanians that are happy about that, um, but there are many Caymanians that are impacted by that also. Cayman now has an excellent opportunity to choose a tourism strategy based on quality, not quantity. That means to stay over tourism's um, model must be the focus, and it becomes even more important to, to, to us and, and, and the economy of the Cayman Islands. Hotels, condos, villas are the backbone of stayover um, tourism in Seven Mile Beach in particular, and therefore, I think hotels will become more important to our economy, not less. Um, I think we can choose not to incentivize hotels or developers, and we do not need to grant concessions. I repeat, Given our tax-neutral status and the draw that we are, the Cayman Islands government does not need to grant hundreds of millions of dollars in concessions. It's an ad hoc politicized uh, process where there is no sort of transparency to it. So I would suggest if the people of the Cayman Islands want to um, get better, we need Thank leadership that understands better you. and will do better. We do not need to incentivize developers to the tune Thank that you. we're doing with no rhyme or reason and no transparency to it. Thank you. This question has to do with pension reform. Mr. Moxham, the recent withdrawal from pension se private sector pension funds has depleted the ability of many residents to have enough funds when they retire. 
What ideas would you recommend to address this shortfall? Uh, great question, but let me just start at the top. People need to understand the government didn't do anything for, that, for them. The government allowed people to have access to their own monies. Whilst the government were giving hundreds of millions of dollars in concessions to everybody else, they chose for you to dig into your own pocket, into your own pensions, in order to survive this pandemic. Now, that's the reality of the situation, so I don't want anybody to think that they did us a favor. We're using our own monies, our own pensions, and now we have to go back and find a way to top it up. The irony of all of that is the government uh, pension is woefully unfunded to the tune of $1.4 billion. So government's going to tell you to use your money, um, get your money out to help yourself. They don't adequately fund or pay off the unfunded pension liabilities for the civil servants. And now, effectively, it's just a conversation of here's what you should do. Leadership starts with doing it right yourself, and then you're able to help people from there. Um, what I would say, it's short-sighted and in, not in the long-term interest of Caymanian people what was decided. It was a policy decision made on the spur to make people think that they were winning. Long-term, you have to put that money back. Um, at the end of the day, will the government ensure that persons are able to do so? Probably not. Because, at the, because the pension regime in the Cayman Islands is woefully, woefully, woefully inadequate. And we need to have a comprehensive um, overview or overhaul of the, uh, uh, of the regime, whereby we understand that now we've taken money out. We're going to have to put more money in to our pensions, but that's going to have to come with greater contributions from the public. So we're getting screwed twice if truth be told, because we took a short-term view of this thing instead of looking at it long-term and, and asking the government to help us in the same way that they're able to help multi-millionaire and billionaire developers. Thank you, Mr. Moxham. Mr. Hugh? Thank you. Um, the, the pension reform, the, the pensions regime um, requires reform in, in no matter what. It required reform before COVID, before the, the, the pension allowances were given. However, the pensions allow, the, the decision on, on providing access to persons' pension at a time when they needed it the most, um, at a time when there was so much uncertainty and, and persons were facing um, uh, uh, real issues in me making ends meet and, and providing for themselves, it would be a, a a tall task for the government to, to process each and every individual at the time to ensure that they were, every citizen of this island um, had the ability to, to make ends meet and to provide for their families. We did consult with the pension providers. That's how we came up with the formula on how much you could withdraw. And if you had under that amount, you could, you know, you could withdraw if you had under 10,000, all of it. Um, because we saw that that would normally be younger persons or persons who just entered the scheme and would have the time to, to build back. Um, and then the percentage was one that we felt um, in consultation with the industry that uh, persons had the, the, the funds um, and, and being able to access 25% of those funds would have the ability over the, the time period to, to, to um, repay those funds or re-enter those funds into their, um, into their pension, into the pension scheme. But Overall, overall, um, the, the pension scheme needs reform, reform, and I think that's something that, again, um, that we will have to deal with in the coming years. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Uh, my last question of the evening, um, not the last question, but my last question <laughs> of the evening uh, for you, Mr. Hugh, because it touches on financial services. Given that financial services is critical to the island's economy, how do you think the country should respond to the FATF grey listing and the EU's intention to blacklist us, even though we have met most of their requirements? Yeah, and that is a difficult one. I, I think the response is, has to be that, that we will continue to do what we have been doing. Um, we, have, we have continued to provide progress and show progress. And, and in fact, the, the EU um, pointed out that we are the leaders in in, in, um, in in, in the in the industry, in our anti money laundering and anti terrorism um, uh, regulations, those three the three items that we were grey listed for um, 
two of those we will have no problem in in achieving in the time frame given the third one is a very difficult one and that being um convictions how do you, do you make up um <laughs> cases to convict people i mean how do you how do you prove that you are not convicting enough people um that is going to be the challenge but we do believe that the out of i think 60 something points out of uh, you know when we started the process we're down to three i think that's a tremendous achievement i think that cannot be overlooked it will not be overlooked and we'll be able to achieve the the two other uh, requirements within the time frame time frame given to us um certainly this government would be able to achieve it and the third one we'll have to argue that point and i do believe that they will find it hard um to hold us on a blacklist based on that point thank you Mr. Moxham, same question. Um, the reality for industry is it won't stop. They'll keep coming. At the end of the day, that's the reality. And we have to do a better job of promoting what we do as a jurisdiction. That involves leveraging all relevant stakeholders, um, utilizing uh, organizations like Cayman Finance, having close working relationships with the Tax Information Authority and the Ministry of Financial Services. If everybody in financial services puts their thinking caps on and understands that this is about Team Cayman, we'll be fine. We have not done a good enough job in sharing with the world what Cayman is and what it does. Cayman is a tax-neutral jurisdiction that helps the world and multinational organizations organize um, and execute um, complex transactions in a tax-neutral manner. That should be on every T-shirt, every postcard. We should be having publications in every major um, industry um, 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 piece. But more importantly, we need to be leveraging the first-class service providers that we have here in the Cayman Islands. Instead of spending resources and money um, to set up offices overseas, which are not necessary at this stage, what we should be doing is speaking to the first class accounting firms, law firms that have offices in these major jurisdictions and having those service providers contracted to speak on behalf of the Cayman Islands because they understand the, te the, technic the technicalities involved, but more importantly, they have pre-existing relationships with all of the key players, um, lobbyists and decision makers in the EU and so on and so forth. We are not leveraging that opportunity properly, but can we fix it? 100%. Everyone has to get on the same page. The reason why I'm so bullish on Cayman is because they would have you think that we don't pay taxes. We do. They're called stamp duty. They're called licensing fees, work permits, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the trade and business license, the company management fees, so on and so forth. Thank you. We haven't done a good enough job in explaining what we do, how we do it, but but we can because we have enough first class people on the ground that understand this is the lifeblood of the Cayman Islands. Thank you. Okay, so I have the pleasure of the last question. Big breath, Mr. Moxon. I'm going to finish it off starting with you. And this has to do with growth management. What is your view on the current level of population growth and development and the resultant impact on the country's infrastructure? Additionally, what measures would you recommend so that Caymanians benefit from a growing economy? Okay. The current pace of development is one part of the problem. The other part is that there's no national plan for sustainable um, growth or management. The pace of physical development seems to be too much for a lot of people. Um, it's too fast and it's straining our current infrastructure. What we need is to balance the physical infrastructure and ensure that we are doing all that we possibly can to help the human development, the human capital development of our people. We need to plan and manage growth, and by doing so, all Caymanians will then be able to live well. Living well represents everyone having the chance to have dignity, and their rights will be respected, basic needs will be met, and equal opportunities are available for all. Right now, that isn't happening. Caymanians are on the outside looking at an economic boom and we're hoping that maybe somebody will give us a chance. That's unacceptable. Um, Caymanians need to benefit from the growing uh, economy and we need government that will put Caymanians first. Everywhere else in the world, Americans matter, Canadians matter, British people matter. But in Cayman, what has happened is 
we have become secondary and third class citizens in our own country. And that's driven due to a lack of a pro Caymanian policy whereby we should get opportunities in our own country. There's no, we do not have a level playing field. Caymanians are increasingly disadvantaged by their own um, policies and government. And this is happening to both new Caymanians and multi generational Caymanians. In the first 100 days, I will embark on an aggressive, stakeholder-driven development of a Vision 2030, a national plan for our sustainable future. I'll designate certain jobs for Caymanians only and use an effective transition period to prepare employers. Um, it won't be crazy. It won't be radical. It will be well thought out, and it will be in consultation with industry. We have to commission a census because right now we're making decisions without verifiable data, and that is hurting us as a country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oxum. Mr. Hugh? Thank you very much. Um, the current levels of population, I, I, I think um, post-COVID, um, we're unsure of exactly where that is, but I do believe that, that we can all agree that once we reopen our borders um, and once we have the pandemic behind us, that we will see, uh, again, a return to, to more persons on the island, both uh, working within industry and, of course, um, visiting and our long, what I call, extended stay tourists. Um, I think this has been working for us over the last few years. The economy has been booming. Um, private sector has been very, very healthy. Um, the, the idea of, of attracting tourists that will stay three to six months at a time uh, covers those peaks and valleys that we would usually have where uh, uh, restaurants would have to close for two months at a time because it just didn't make sense to stay open. Uh, retail would go through a drought. It was more, if you've ever been in the retail industry, um, it was a famine and feast type of thing. You had a few months that you, you were doing well, and then, you know, you had a few months that things were, were, were famine. So, you know, the, 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 the program that we've been doing as far as attracting the extended stay tourists from three to six months, persons that were invested in, in real estate here has worked out well for us. Uh, we do have to ensure that, and, and we are a free enterprise um, economy, um, but we do have laws that protect Caymanians. And that is for us to continue to drive the policies that guide those laws, the, the, the LCCL regime, the trade and business license regime, and the work permit regime are all there to protect Caymanians. They're all there to look out for, uh, or to, to protect Caymanians, that they have their opportunities, the first opportunity to participate in, in the economy. And, you know, once you have a strong economy and opportunities are there, then as the old cliche says, you know, the rising tide floats all boats. Is that the expectation is that we will all benefit from it. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. 20 questions. Thank the candidates for taking the time to join us and responding to those questions. At this particular time, we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we return, we're going to have closing statements from each of our candidates this evening. Please stay tuned. Closing statements from each of our candidates. We're going to begin with Mr. Joseph Hugh. Thank you very much, Will. And uh, once again, thank you for hosting us this evening. It's, it's been a, a, a solid uh, set of questions and some good discussion this evening, I believe. Um, you know, prior to, to the COVID pandemic, the country was, it was in, a fa in, in, in fantastic financial shape. 
Um, we were we were boasting surpluses, cash reserves, uh, unemployment was, was was we had full employment of Caymanians at only three point something percent, um, and then we had COVID, and then you know the, the the government at the time and the government at that time, based on all of the the performances and the abilities that we had financially, were were able to make the tough decision. The tough decision was to put lives before money and protect our people that has now put us uh, made us an envy of the region i and and if if persons around the world as friends tell me all the time they speak to their family in europe they speak to their family in south america everywhere and they're just jealous at the life that we're living here in this pandemic we have one of the lowest debt to gdps in the world I mean, you know, in the world, not just in the region, but in the world, we have the highest, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, you know, right up there with, with Israel. Um, we've cut our debt in half over the last several months. Um, we, we can, you know, the country at this time needs continuity. It needs a government that has the ability to continue to protect its people, to continue to guide us through this pandemic and to steer us into the next phase of our reopening of the borders and the rebuilding of our tourism product in a safe and measured manner in an experience um, with experience guiding uh, us through that process. We are, we are as a government and in this election as the progressives and, a, and its alliance, the only real choice for a cohesive set of persons persons sharing in the same goals and the same um, plans to take this country forward. I don't think it's in the best interest of this country at this time to change a government, a government that has led us through some of the most difficult times, taken us through some of the best times we'd seen in the economy in decades, and then taken us through some of the most difficult times while still being the envy of the region. We are the only option of a full slate of candidates that will continue the progress of this country and continue to protect and keep our people safe. Thank you. Mr. Johan Moxham. Just want to uh, start off by saying again, thank you to the chamber for the opportunity. Thanks for my opponent for showing up because some of his teammates um, haven't attended these forums. So I'm grateful that, that we could have this discussion. Um, why am I the candidate that you should vote for. I am a man that knows the difference between right and wrong. I'm a man that will always do the right thing. I'm a man that doesn't need to do the politically expedient thing. Because in my head, based on my character, my morals, and everything about me, doing the right thing is always the right thing. I won't duck, I won't hide, I won't deflect, I won't follow leaders that allow persons to question my integrity, my competences, my honesty, and my core belief system. I want to work for the people of Georgetown North. I want to represent all the people in Georgetown North. Every Caymanian, first generation, 10th generation Caymanian. We talk about the success of Cayman, and I'm grateful that we live in a healthy, beautiful country where a lot of people are making it, but there are a lot of people that are struggling right now, and they're being left behind because the current administration is focused on them. I want to work for you. It is frustrating and embarrassing to see that we've left our people behind whilst we focus on bringing in more people from the outside who further will cause the sort of divisions because they just don't understand what Cayman and Caymanians are about. It makes no sense to build this country with fancy roads, fancy buildings, and all of the opulence if the people from the Cayman Islands are suffering. And right now, we're failing in education, we're failing with job opportunities, and we're failing because our government aren't focused on us. They're focused on them. My opponent works for people of a select class. 
I want to work for everybody. I will be honored to do so, and I will show up every day, give you my very best. I will never embarrass myself, my family, or this country, because Cayman deserves better. Well, thank if you. If you think that thank your life is good now, charted over the last four years, is your life better today? Yes or no? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. Thank you, candidates. Now I'm going to turn it over to President Mike Gibbs for closing remarks. Thank you, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to thank the Georgetown North candidates for participating in this evening's forum. I trust that the forum will help the voters in that constituency to determine who to vote for on April the 14th. I would also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship of the Chamber's candidate forums, as well as Affinity Recruitment, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and DART. If you're interested in viewing more of the Growth Matters video series that have been playing during tonight's commercial breaks, they can be accessed at growthmatters.ky. Please join us Monday evening as we welcome Barbara Connolly and Alric Lindsay from the constituency of Georgetown South. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and I hope you will join us on Monday evening at the same time. Have a great weekend. Good night.